I'm glad you're all here tonight. We have a little competition with the uh, presidential debate, but hopefully you guys are taping it at home and you can watch it when you get home. But um, again, good evening. We're thrilled that you're here. We're excited. My name is Jean Nagelkirk, and I'm the Vice Provost for Health at Grand Valley State University. Um, on behalf of Grand Valley, I want to welcome you to the DeVos Medical Ethics Colloquy. Um, tonight's presentations will be on the medicalization of society, and we have had the great opportunity. We had the Promoting Interprofessional Education for Student um, group up in a classroom, and our two speakers were kind enough to give them a pre-briefing, so we had that. We have this live stream today. So anywhere in the country you can get it. And three of our classrooms, one in philosophy, one in nursing, and then our promoting interprofessional education for students will be having this stream to their classrooms. And they will run down some questions if they have any. So we're excited for that. Um, the PIPES program is part of the Midwest Interprofessional Practice Education Research Center, which is a regional interinstitutional infrastructure created to infuse interprofessional care into our community to improve the quality and safety. So we're excited for them. They're learning as they're young, and they will be the workforce of the future. Um, Grand Valley is the major provider of health professionals for the West Michigan region. In fact, we have a new record number of students that have um, started this fall. We have 25,460, of which approximately one-third are in a health-related profession or 9,394 students. So as you can only imagine, ethics is an integral part of their curriculum, of a health professional curriculum. So we're so thrilled that we have the opportunity to host the biennial colloquy series so that our students can learn and continue to grow, as well as have the clinicians and the providers and practitioners in town be able to gain this information as well. I want to thank the Helen or the uh, Rich and Helen DeVos Foundation. They have made a gift that we can do these colloquies, and it's a very generous one. And I especially want to thank Dr. Luis Tomatis. Dr. Tomatis actually initiated the colloquy. He got the organizing committee together to come up with thought-provoking, um, ethical, thorny issues and do these twice a year. He provides leadership to the colloquy. He looks up and investigates potential speakers and researches the topic and presents them to the committee. He takes his expertise and shares it with others so that we can have a successful ethical colloquy for our community. So I am deeply indebted to Dr. Luis Tomatis. I also, if you're able, at the organizing committee, if you would mind standing, because I want people to recognize you for the planning committee. So any of the organizing members, I see you here. <laughs> Thank you so much. They are integral, too. And now, because the most important part of the colloquy is the speakers themselves, Dr. Luis Tomatis will introduce the concept here. How do you move this? Well, good evening. Uh, welcome to the 24th the Both Medical Ethics Colloquy. Uh, I am sure after you hear the speakers, you will find out that there is no competition with the debate. <laughs> uh, our intellectual level is by far higher than theirs. Well, the subject is the medicalization of society, and you will see why we chose this subject. Uh, there is a webcast that you can get and review this over and over any time. We have Dr. Jerome Wakefield and Dr. Michael First as two, our two speakers. The sponsors are the divorces that have no conflict of interest. As you know, the, the format is half hour every speaker, and then one hour of question and answer, of which the last 20 minutes will be uh, for the public. And Dr. Cory Waller will be the moderator. 
you have the question cards in your folder, and there will be two volunteers. You can send it us as the speakers are speaking, and they will send to Dr. Sander to collate them. When you raise your hands and the question and answer, the volunteer will come to you with a portable mic microphone. Be clear and be short. The procedure for claiming the CME credits is a little different this year. Um, you will have to claim them after the presentation, but you need to sign the sheets that were in the front in order that we can turn to the CME. The white, the white forms are the ones that inform us what you think about each one of our presentation and how can we improve in the future. <laughs> we always put this because it seems to be such highly intellectual group never gets it. <laughs> if, if you st strongly disagree, is number one. And you strongly agree, is number four. Please remember that. It contains this auditorium T loop that will speak, the speaker will speak directly to your ear. And now, please kindly turn off your, and I will have to turn mine too, um, your, your everything that makes noise, and we will lead Dr. Sanders. Yes. Thank you, Dr. Tomatis. Um, it is a, an honor and a privilege to be here. I um, was um, connected with Dr. Tomatis, and he asked me if I would be uh, the moderator for this event. And um, at first, I wasn't unsure exactly why, but then we talked about the topic, and then we talked about the, the medicalization of society and how that may interface with not only medicine, but psychiatry in general. So welcome to the 24th uh, DeVos Medical Ethics Colloquy. And so think about those words for a second, ethics and, and colloquy. This is, a, and I'm gonna circle back to that, but this is hosted by uh, Grand Valley State University. So thank you, uh, Grand Valley State University, for hosting this. Um, my nephew is currently living in my basement and going to the Grand Valley State University Honors College. So uh, thank you, Grand Valley State University. Um, my nephew wakes me up at five o'clock every morning to work out, so I don't know uh, um, how I feel about that right now. But uh, regardless, um, we're extremely happy and excited to have you joining us um, today. And just to introduce myself, uh, my name is uh, Bill Sanders. I'm a psychiatrist, and I work at uh, Pine Rest Christian Mental Health Services in town here. I did my uh, general psychiatry residency training at Michigan State University. And then after I finished my um, general adult psychiatry residency training, I went down to the University of Florida and did a fellowship in forensic psychiatry for one year. And I had the privilege of working in uh, um, the prison system and working on death row. And kind of uh, with the medicalization of society, sometimes I, I think about that in terms of um, the medicalization of criminal behavior too is a topic that we, we talk about in forensic psychiatry quite a bit. Um, and so in the, in the terms of thinking about ethics, at Pine Rest, we um, started a psychiatry residency training program. And as we were developing that training program and thinking about our roles as psychiatrists and as physicians, I felt that ethics is one of the most important things we have to deal with. Um, and, and just to be able to take a step back when we're training um, our psychiatrists, so much they're focused in the day-to-day, -day, the standardized medicine and the care of patients that sometimes we need to take a step back and really kind of think about what we're doing. And so we, um, or I insisted that we have ethics in the first year of the curriculum of that training program. And so then when we talk about the definition of ethics with the residents, um, the, the definition I, I like and that's um, easy for them to remember is ethics is knowing the difference between what you have the right to do and what is right to do. And so trying to help them distinguish that knowing the rules and practicing medicine and doing the right thing in medicine. Um, and so I was just kind of reviewing that, that concept with the residents today. It's not always um, um, clear what is the right thing to do, and especially with the, the medicalization of society and thinking about the different things, and I'm sure they're gonna touch on this, and I don't wanna get too much into the definition. 
but thinking about things that may have been medicalized, like oh, obesity, depression, anxiety, childbirth, things like that, I'm always a little bit taken aback that male pattern baldness is one of those as well. So I, I half wonder if that's why Dr. Tomatis wanted me to do the, the moderating today. Um, regardless, um, I think that we have some um, an interesting topic to review today. Um, and just in, in the real world sense of things, just today um, there was an article that was sent to me by the residents. And just so that the students that are listening and hearing this today, this, this is a topic that we kind of, even today, it was amazing in my email today, there was an article that came out, does psychiatry worsen mental illness stigma? And a resident sent that to me. And then it stimulated um, a really thoughtful discussion by board certified psychiatrists who were sending emails back and forth within a, within a couple hours. And so just briefly, one of the, the comments was, the brain, as we know, is more than the sum of its anatomic parts. It is a grand central station for all the other organs to communicate with one another. The brain is the organ that controls feelings, thoughts, and behaviors of the organism. When we feel sick because of physical or emotional pain, it is our brain telling us we feel sick. It is our brain thinking of ways to feel better. It is also our brain controlling our sickness behavior. It's okay for us to be the people who name what we do instead of letting others name it for us. We are psychiatrists, the first physicians to specialize in the treatment of brain disorders. Just as Pinell freed women from, the, from chains in the 1800s, let us physicians and knowledge sharers free the minds of others and embrace our brains in sickness and health. Um, one more comment and then I will get to our speakers. And in a reply, it said, uh, what, this is the end of the, the next statement is, which brings me to the point brought up by the previous doctor stating that it is a biological fact that the brain is the organ that control, control feelings, emotions, thoughts, and behaviors. I personally refuse to reduce my entire humanity and that of others to a collection of synapses, action potentials, and neurotransmitters. Our feelings and thoughts which control our behavior and clearly abstract notions immaterial whereas the brain is very tangible, concrete, and physical. Does the brain actually have a localization for our sense of beauty, compassion, love, poetry, hope, peace, and justice? The cerebral cortex is nothing but layers of neurons, dendrites, and glial, glial cells communicating and sending electrical impulses to subcortical areas and other organs in the body. But who, what is giving others these neurons in the first place? I think psychiatrists and other scientists should free themselves from the reductionist views of the brain as the master organ and start embracing the existence of higher controlling and pervasive power. So that, would, that just happened today. And so that's why we're getting today to kind of figure out what is this all about? What is the medicalization of society? So I'm not going to talk much more because we have two very distinguished presenters who are going to answer that very question for us today. Today we have with us, uh, first speaking first will be Dr. Jerome Wakefield. Um, Dr. Jerome Wakefield is a university professor of social work and professor of the Conceptual Foundations of Psychiatry in the School of Medicine as well as affiliate faculty and advisory board member of the Center of Bioethics at, university, at New York University. After Dr. Wakefield speaks, uh, then, we'll be, then we'll have Dr. Michael First, who is a professor of clinical psychiatry at Columbia University, a research psychiatrist at the biometrics department of the New York State Psychiatric in Institute and maintains a schema therapy and psychopharmacology practice in Manhattan. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to let these two very capable and distinguished uh, speakers uh, get started. Dr. Wakefield, you're up first. Can you now hear me? Everybody hear me okay? All the way in back and front, not too loud? Okay, terrific. Let's see now if I can, whoops. Okay. Well, first of all, just I'm honored and delighted to be here. I thank, uh, there's, whoops, there's so many people to thank. This is just a few of them and Bill uh, and others on the organizing committee. Uh, and uh, so I thank you all for the effort you put in to create this uh, wonderful occasion. I think it's particularly wonderful because there is such an interdisciplinary group here. 
And that, to me, is very, very important. Philosophy, clinical theory, uh, these are interwoven in a way, uh, and they need to meet. And this is one place where they're meeting, which I really, really like to see. No conflicts of interest that I know of. Um, and I, as an ethical issue, I just say right away, I'm going to be talking about what is and is not a disorder. Now, in this group, I probably don't have to say this, but in a lot of groups, I need to say, don't take anything I say as sufficient to diagnose your, you know, your cousin or your spouse or something like that. This, that requires assessment by an expert. Uh, I'm not, I wasn't officially involved in the DSM uh, effort, so I'm not bound by any confidentiality <laughs> agreements. Uh, and uh, a lot of the stuff I'll be talking about is copyrighted by the APA, and they have no particular involvement in this presentation. Look, the topic we're talking about here is a, a, a really important one. <laughs> it's, it's, this is just the beginnings of it. Um, the, the question is, to what degree is our medical knowledge, especially in psychiatry, as we enter on this new era of exploration of the brain, going to change our ability to regulate all manner of our behavior. We have people talking about regulating the degree of affection, you, you know, regulating um, all sorts of feelings, emotions, uh, attitudes. And we actually have some initial knowledge about how to do that. We have initial knowledge about triggers of sexual interest of aggression. And guess what? There's a little section of uh, neurons that if you fire those, it's both sexual interest and aggression simultaneously. We're learning a lot of stuff that is going to challenge how we think about ourselves, give us powers to manipulate behavior. We've got to be thinking about these ethical issues uh, and their conceptual underpinnings. There's a fear that um, just as we see with globalization and technology advancing, that this new knowledge of the brain and its effects on behavior and our ability to manipulate it with new neuron level manipulations that we're now capable of uh, for the first time, um, could, the science fiction fantasy is it could lead to a world that doesn't tolerate deviance, doesn't tolerate difference, that insists on efficiency, efficiency, efficiency in the way, you know, I work a lot on grief and the pathologization of grief in the way that young people say when they, when I finish these talks, they come up and say, you know, if something happens and I'm grieving and I'm out of work for more than a day, people say, go get some medication and come back. We need you. So the efficiency motive uh, and a kind of totalitarianism in a psychiatric sense is a kind of nightmare people have. Also, there's these questions everybody's starting to ask. If you fall in love with somebody who's on antidepressants, have you fallen in love with them? Or have you fallen in love with some mm, version of them that's on the antidepressants? Um, and uh, what happens when they go off the antidepressants? Are you still committed to that person? Uh, and so on. There's a lot of interesting questions that are arising. Um, what, who's the real you? Uh, Peter Kramer argued some time back that if you take antidepressants and you are feeling depressed, that the real you is the person that emerges when you're taking the antidepressants. Other people say, no, that's not right. Antidepressants are perturbing you from the real you. All of the, these issues about who we are are being raised by these new capacities we have for manipulating ourselves. And it all also reflects a very deep issue Help philosophers in the room. We need, we've never been able to resolve, you know, since Descartes, the um, mind-body problem. And that sounds like a trite statement for a philosopher. But in psychiatry, it has an impact every single day. That's a very immediate impact. We don't really understand how to put together our folk concepts of belief, desire, emotion, meaning with the simultaneous understanding we're getting of the brain going on and determining what we're doing. There, there, there's two levels here that have to be put together, understood together, and yet nobody's kind of has a satisfying or at least has, has in, in evoked a, a consensual attitude towards how to resolve this. And as a result, 
we have a kind of split in the field, people who want to focus on meaning, people who think maybe meaning is an epiphenomenon that we'll get rid of, and all we're going to know is about the brain. Maybe beliefs and desires are a pre-scientific notion, and we'll get rid of that eventually as we come to understand the brain. So these very deep issues in philosophy of mind that go back several hundred years are actually right now intersecting with where we are in the knowledge we're developing in psychiatry. It's an amazingly interesting time to be, to be uh, dealing with these issues. At a more personal level, I know there's a lot of clinicians here. Um, I call this the clinician's dilemma. Psychiatry has expanded so rapidly. I think there's no doubt, as I'll argue a little later, uh, that we are, in fact, overdiagnosing disorder, especially mental disorder, at enormous rates in many instances. Uh, if you agree with that, then you're faced with the fact, well, as a clinician, if the diagnostic criteria that are put forward officially are too broad, and I have somebody come in, and I think they need and deserve help, but on the other hand, I, um, I truly don't believe that they actually are, um, have a disorder. What do I do? Uh, this is a dilemma. This isn't a theoretical dilemma. My friends who are in clinical practice face this every day. Um, I have people who, let's say, do only ADHD work. And I say to them, well, how many of your 100% uh, of practice, per what's the percentage of people that truly have a disorder? And what, which are the kids that just are too fidgety for school, but you figure they're in normal range, but they need something to help them do well, and their parents wants, want it, so you go along with that. And this has been discussed in the New York Times, this practice. It's not a shocker or a radical critique. Of course, it's going on in massive scale. And uh, my friends tell me, oh, 50 to 75% are probably not disordered and the other 25%, there's really something wrong with their attentional mechanisms. This is a dilemma. People that come in who are sad, who have life circumstances that are terrible, it comes up all the time in clinical training. So um, the clinician's dilemma is a real one, and it is an ethical dilemma that I'm not going to try to solve today. I'm going to try to understand the, what's behind it and the intellectual underpinnings of some of these issues but it's something that needs to be addressed more. We were living in a reimbursement system that is um, self-defeating, I think often cruel and unjust, but it is the reimbursement system that allows us to regain, to, to gain support to help people. How do you deal with it when people need and deserve help, but they don't technically fall under the requirement of medical necessity in a literal sense? I'm going to get to some examples of this. Medicalization uh, uh, is really a huge domain these days uh, of discussion, and um, I, I'm going to quickly go through a couple of other senses of it before I get to the sense that's going to uh, occupy me today. I'm going to just be focusing on one sense of medicalization. But the first sense is just the professional domain, the shift of authority to the medical profession. Uh, and so things that have been tr generally treated by other groups as being non-medical issues then get treated by doctors. Now this can include an enormous number of things. They don't have to be disorders at all. Childbirth versus natural delivery or delivery at home with a midwife, but now it's monitored and by a physician, takes place in the hospital, and so on and so forth. That's one sense of medicalization, something coming gradually under the authority of medicine and having its monitoring uh, uh, over it. Menopause is often mentioned here, uh, cosmetic surgery related to beauty. Um, alcoholism uh, used to be more of a moral problem, now is considered a medical problem. Uh, ADHD used to be rambunctious children, a discipline problem, now it's a disorder. So these are all things that have moved under medical authority. I'm not saying all of them are non-disorders. Some of them may be disorders, but they've all moved under medical authority. Uh, a lot of this discussion goes back to Ivan Illich and Medical Nemesis, where he talked about the medicalization of death and how what was considered to be uh, the natural process of death has become anything but uh, with people in the hospital and fighting every step of the way 
even when it makes no sense. And this actually gave rise to some degree to the hospice movement and palliative care. It was a very influential book. I won't be covering everything in the slides. I've got too many slides, uh, so please forgive me. I will be using them to trigger what I want to say. And um, later on, this will all be on YouTube or somewhere if you want to catch up on the details that, I, that you missed on the slides. So um, the second sense is biologicalization. That is, coming to see things in terms of the biology underlying whatever the phenomenon was when it wasn't initially thought of that way. Um, so addiction isn't intense desire and bad choices, but it's a brain disease, as we are told endlessly uh, by the government. Uh, and um, generally, we use talk of the biology now to just dismiss something. Uh, these are actual conversations I've had. Why did X commit suicide? Because he was bipolar. There's no, no meaning content to it at all. Uh, it's just a, a disorder that's presumably biologically based. Um, a concern here is that biologicalization has no morality to it. There's, there's, there's a question of whether it undermines our moral discourse to be talking about each other this way below the meaning system level in terms of the biology. Uh, on the good side, it may relieve us of stigma, that's the argument. Uh, on the bad side, it seems to undermine moral uh, commitments. Now, actually, just as a matter of philosophy here for a moment and not a matter of describing the field, the argument that going to a biological level somehow relieves us of moral censure is actually fallacious in my mind. I mean, people who believe this generally argue that everything mental is biological, therefore we might just well describe everything in biological terms. That's their general attitude is everything mental is really biological, so let's just go to the biological level. But if that's true, then moral weakness is biological. And the biological level trait that you're picking out may well be the trait that corresponds to moral weakness. And so it may well be that in talking about biology, although you're not directly talking about it, you are indeed actually still talking about moral traits. And they can then be brought back up into the conversation if indeed they are what this biological process uh, is a substrate for. Now, um, very often, actually, morality and disorder go together. People have blamed people for getting PTSD or war neurosis in the old days because they considered it a byproduct of being a coward, that you weren't brave enough, therefore that's why you weakly fell prey to this disorder. And there are, there are other, other examples of this. So there's no, it's not a clean cut uh, break between the biological level and then getting rid of the moral level. But it is true that this is one of the things that bothers people the most. What about the reduction of stigma argument? This is one of the main arguments used by people who want to go to the biological level of discourse. We'll get rid of stigma because then we're not talking morality anymore. We're not talking about meaning. We're not talking about the person's personality. We're talking about their brain. And uh, therefore, there will not be moral stigma. Oh, you're a weak person. Oh, you're a person who's a coward and so on and so forth. Now, leaving philosophy aside here and going to the empirical literature, it turns out that if you're worried about stigmatization of people with mental disorders, it's just empirically not true. There have been a lot of studies of this. It's just empirically not true that biologicalizing it, suggesting it's due to biogenetic underpinnings, is going to relieve the person of stigma as it's usually measured. Stigma is measured in a variety of ways, not only moral blame, but for instance, would you be willing to live near this person or next to this person? Would that bother you? Would you keep your kids away from this person? So on, other measures of, many measures of, of, of stigma. How, how, do you think this person has the possibility of getting better? Turns out if you actually study this in detail, you find that people are very subtle philosophers about this. And depending on the specific nature of the disorder, and the specific biological theory of it, they come to all sorts of varying conclusions. In, the, in, a, in a major review uh, recently, um, what they found was that in the study, in the uh, 
conditions they studied, it did reduce moral blame to say that something was biological, it was in the brain. Uh, but on the other hand, it increased pessimism about the person ever changing. Uh, and it did not, a major, a major criterion, it did not change desire to be distant from the person and to avoid them. So there's no simple cure. As far as the empirical studies go, there is no simple fix for stigma in biologicalization, contrary to what you hear. Now I'm getting to what I'm going to discuss for the remainder of my, my time, which is conceptual medicalization, um, which is, which, or another word for it is pathologization, which is labeling something as a, as a disorder, and I'm going to focus on mental disorders, when it is not in truth a disorder. Now, when you do that, you get what I call a false, po or generally called a false positive diagnosis. It's a diagnosis of disorder of some condition that is not really a disorder. So that's what we're going to be talking about now. Thomas Oz really started this conversation off in its modern form with his claim that there is no such thing as a mental disorder in the myth of mental disorder, and that it was just um, that psychiatry is just about social control. We use medical jargon to justify psychiatric intervention and using medical techniques to control the behavior that we find irritating or undesirable. And Michel Foucault helped it along with a historical uh, um, perspective on the transformation of non-medical problems into medical problems of psychiatric disorder. Now, uh, medicalization is often used as a negative term, but I'm using it neutrally here to describe something. Yes, it's got something against it right out of the gate because I've said I'm using medicaliz medicalization in the sense of conceptual medicalization of cases where you are not correctly diagnosing. So that's negative. You are actually telling an untruth about the condition. You're saying it's a disorder when it's not. But it could well be that in some cases that's morally justifiable, as I indicated before in talking about the clinician's dilemma. So it's not necessarily always bad to do that. And I think the question that's going to con uh, that I want to address is, when would it be OK, and why are we so open to doing this? You would think if there's massive overdiagnosis, and there are protests against it, that it would be easy to just extirpate it from the manual, because everybody would agree. But we don't agree. Um, and I think there are reasons beyond conceptual confusion that we don't agree. I think there are moral reasons. Now, to say what I'm about to say, I have to have a concept of disorder. And unfortunately, this could take us the whole time. So <laughs> uh, the concept of disorder itself is highly controversial. Uh, I have staked out a position. What's clear is that psychiatry does much more than treat disorder. Uh, DSM itself lists the Z codes that are not disorders that are often seen by mental health professionals. Uh, we help people to enhance their potential. We help people to cope with stress and all sorts of other things, met marital problems, and so on. But mental disorder is at the core of our profession, mental health professions in general because we are health professions. Otherwise, we would not be health professions. We would not have the privileges and responsibilities that the health professions have. So more or less everybody understands that this is a necessary criterion that we must address this. And then all these other things are kind of add-ons to some degree. If we confuse disorder with other conditions, lots of problems arise. If you want to do research, to find cures for disorders. And you have a mixed sample of people, let's just take my area of grief and sadness. So your sample consists, because the criteria is so broad, you've got, gone out and used the criteria to select a sample. The sample actually consists of a bunch of people who are having normal reactions to uh, life vicissitudes of making them sad or grieve. And then uh, some people have something genuinely wrong with their sadness generating emotional systems, whatever that, that is. Um, your results are not going to be interpretable. You, don't know, you won't know down the line if it actually helps. Your results are going to be muddied by this mixture of people 
In fact, you might not even be able to tell that an agent, let's say a pharmacological agent, helps when it does help disorder because the results may be muted by the, uh, by, by the inclusion of a lot of people that are going to naturally be getting better because they have transient conditions of normality. In other words, it poses basic challenges to the entire research enterprise, and yet this is the kind of thing that's going on, a gigantic research enterprise based on definitions that, in my mind, are often dubious. Of course, at a more immediate level, informed consent is problematic. Prognosis, is this transient normal reaction or a disorder that's going to go on and on? Should I be giving, doing heroic things to prevent recurrence or not worrying about recurrence at all? All of these things, as well as policy formation, all of this depends on some accuracy in picking out what is a disorder and what is not. Plus, there's lots of practical issues involved in getting diagnosed when you don't have a disorder, from life insurance to uh, custody trials and so on. Well, I just... <clears throat> putting, slapping down a bunch of criteria to show something is irritating and bad isn't enough to make it a disorder. Here's Jordan Smoller, who's now a psychiatric geneticist at Harvard when he was a, doc, when he was a medical student. The etiology and treatment of childhood, he tried to show, uh, make fun of DSM. So he put down a bunch of criteria, you know, <laughs> Oh, uh, well, this is a serious condition we've been ignoring, <laughs> childhood. Look at the disadvantages. Your social role is in, impairment is enormous. You can't really do anything. Um, you've got congenital onset, which obviously makes it suspicious, <laughs> genetic. Uh, you've got severe dwarfism relative to normal people. Um, you've got emotional lability and immaturity that's comparable only to severe personality disorder, and so on. And I, I like my favorite, of course, being legume anorexia the inability to eat vegetables that are good for you, like spinach and broccoli and so on. So slapping down a bunch of criteria that look like something that's problematic is not enough to make it a disorder, which is the problem here. Now, I've, I've proposed that a mental disorder or a disorder is a harmful dysfunction. It's got to cause harm. There's a value component. But it's also got to be based, harm has to come out of a dysfunction something going wrong with some internal mechanism. By going wrong, I mean that it's not doing something it was biologically designed to do, which I relate ultimately to evolutionary theory. Now, every statement I just made is highly controversial and has been controver controverted, and I can't go into it more, or that would be the remainder of my time. But that's, that's what this, and this is somewhat parallel, except it expands on the DSM's definition of disorder. But the point is, it's got to be something going wrong. It can't just be something that we don't like. That eliminates social deviance. That eliminates other forms of things that we just want to get rid of. It's got to be an objective fact of something going wrong. Even if we don't know that it's there, we're inferring it. We don't know what's going wrong in most mental disorders, but we infer circumstantially that something is going wrong from the way human beings are biologically designed to operate. Their anxiety systems are going off helter-skelter all the time, not when there's danger or any threat. They can't think in a rational way. Whatever it is, uh, we, we judge that something is going wrong with some system, even if we don't know much about it. We're at a primitive level here still. Now, medicalization, labeling something a disorder that's not a disorder, um, has a lot of problems and has some benefits. Um, it may remove social stigma, that is still that argument, may relieve guilt, like a parent with an ADHD child feels relieved when the child is diagnosed and so on. But it also has a lot of disadvantages, encourages reliance on experts, undermines existing institutions, the church, other institutions that have traditionally dealt with people suffering um, and ways of coping. Um, Especially in our brain disease era, I want to make this point. Right now, we're going through an era of, you know, 30 years ago was all psychoanalysis. Now it's every mental disorder is a brain disease. In this era, what that means is that whether you as a clinician do it or not, the tr it, further down the road with that disorder diagnosis in the file, the person is quite conceivably going to get medication or some other, some pharmacological intervention. And the side effects may not be 
uh, warranted in that case. So there are uh, a lot of these problems. Another problem is that according to the Supreme Court, in two different times when they were judging, when they were evaluating sexual predator laws, having a disorder justifies the possibility of a civil proceeding that suspends, it doesn't suspend because they're not applicable to civil proceedings, but it means that all the protections of criminal proceedings are not applicable. So you can have civil proceedings for incarceration in a mental institution that you, if you already went to jail for your crime and then you come out, but this civil proceeding says you have a mental disorder that caused you to likely um, do the crime again, you can be put into an institution. That's not double jeopardy. Uh, if you told your therapist in jail about things you did, that can be brought up. That's not the, the um, self-incrimination does not apply and so on and so forth. Um, preventive detention, something we, I thought we fought the British over, does not apply. You can be put into an institution because it's thought with a certain percentage, and these percentages get pretty low, that you might be a recidivizing person. Um, so this matters. Constitutionally, it matters. And the sick roll. Of course, we talk about constantly the relief of the sick role, the good things about the sick role. You're relieved of responsibility. People don't morally blame you. What we don't talk about is the other side of the sick role. Once you're in the sick role, it's assumed that you're going to try to get better. It's assumed that what you have is a disorder that's perturbing you from your normal state and that if you have a way back to normality, you will take it. Um, the problem here is that it does mean that as things get medicalized, we create a narrower range of acceptability of, emotion, of emotions and behavior for our children and our grandchildren. I'm not sure, I mean, that we have to think about what kind of world we want to give them in terms of acceptable ranges of human emotions and human behavior. Now, I, wanted, I promise to say something about why we do this that's on the positive side and why we do it, I think, there are several different reasons for why the expansion of diagnosis is so acceptable. And I think one of the reasons I call psychological justice. The, the fact of the matter is that normal variation, not disorder, normal variation has portions of it that are disadvantaged, disadvantageous in any given culture. In our culture, we make certain demands on people to, give, to get good jobs and so on. We make certain demands on people and I think we recognize that it's not abnormal, but it is disadvantageous to the degree of perhaps unjust, uh, unjustly depriving people of opportunity in our system to have certain normal traits. If you're a person who normally, within normal range, doesn't like getting up in front of an audience, seeing a large number of unsmiling faces looking at you and probably evaluating what you're saying at that very moment, and a lot of people don't like that, then, and you have various symptoms of anxiety that keep you from doing that, that's not very helpful in modern society because we are a mass society, mass communication society, where many of the best positions require that people get up in front of audiences that evaluate them and look at them. A lot of people are incredibly uncomfortable with that. There's really no evidence. I mean, there is pretty good evidence that it's not abnormal to feel that. And so, if we're going to treat people for so-called social phobia, whose only problem is this performance anxiety, that may be more helping them to access our, our social goods than it is to treat a disorder. And yet, would we not want to do that? It seems absolutely right, because our system, which we're all benefiting from as a matter of justice, owes them something for actually creating a system that works well, but makes them severely disadvantaged. Psychiatry, to the degree it can help make up for things like that, is quite justified, and I think the clinician is justified in helping people. It's clear that DSM includes lots of these justice-related categories that have nothing to do with disorder. To take an obvious one, circadian rhythm disorder shift work type. This is the disorder that afflicts you if you cannot adapt to having your sleep cycle shifted around constantly by shift work. Now, it's absolutely normal 
to be pinned to a reasonable circadian rhythm shift uh, sleep cycle, and a lot of people have trouble adapting out of it. It's not an abnormality, but a large proportion, a surprisingly large proportion of jobs in our culture require your ability to sleep at odd hours and changing hours, and so we have this diagnosis to help people. I think this is a matter of justice, not disorder. ADHD, I'll just say this about ADHD, it's one of the clearest cases there are a wild overdiagnosis. I'm not saying at all that, th that this disorder does not exist. I'm not anti-psychiatric, I'm not denying that there are children who have disorders of their attentional or impulse control mechanisms. There's five different lines of research that suggest that this is actually being overdiagnosed. I'll just tell you one right now because it's particularly amusingly obvious and yet nobody's done anything about it. You take all the kids in a given grade in school. This, by the way, the study I'm describing has been done over and over and replicated. You take all the kids in a given grade of school most cities, it's birth date that determines it, so the kids in a given grade have up to one year difference in their birth date. You look at the rates in a given year that that, class, that cohort going through, you take a given year, sixth grade, seventh grade, whatever, and look at who has been diagnosed along the way with ADHD. The biggest risk factor, other than the symptoms, the biggest risk factor, we're talking risk factors that are unknown in psychology usually, risk factor, like, 50 or 100% greater chance. The biggest risk factor of being diagnosed is being one of the youngest in the class, being in those two or three months that make you one of the youngest. Now, this has been out there for uh, more than a decade. There are replications across school systems. Uh, and guess what? There is no other explanation other than we are massively confusing disruption of class due to developmental immaturity uh, because these kids are younger, with a disorder. Somebody should do something about this. The DSM-5 had a chance. They did nothing about it. Instead, they, had, they expanded ADHD to adults in a way that um, I won't go into now because of time considerations, but I think is simply extending the wild overdiagnosis to the general population from children where it's already been evident. Um, they did, change, they did give new examples. So for instance, instead of your pencils and books for school, now it's your tools, wallets, keys, paperwork, eyeglasses, and mobile telephones, if you misplace them, that suggest you have a symptom of ADHD. Uh, if you hate reviewing lengthy papers or completing forms or reports, this now is an adult form of a child <laughs> symptom, and so on and so forth. Um, so, uh, and also, oh, yes, I forgot to tell you a very, very important one, um, having trouble finding it here is, yes, there it is, difficulty remaining focused during lectures, conversations, or lengthy reading. So wake up now. Okay. <laughs> um, so, again, the DSM has put social impairment as a major criterion for disorder all through the book. This confuses again, and not that it's not necessary sometimes, but it confuses again our cultural pressures, the demands of our society with actual medical disorder. Um, one more, just for fun here, is sexual dysfunction. All the sexual dysfunctions have a situational specifier. That means that you don't have to have a general dysfunction. You can just have this dysfunction when you're with your partner. Now, is it necessarily a medical disorder to, am I about done? Uh, is it necessarily a medical disorder to only have a problem with your partner but be able to function perfectly well with other partners? Most people, historically, there was a big argument in the 19th century about this. Most people say, no, that just shows that you're uninterested in your partner or that you have a problem with your partner. That's not in itself a medical disorder. So we have a lot of more and less subtle uh, problems here. Now, I didn't get to the one I have talked about most in my own work, um, the bereavement exclusion and the um, diagnosis of depression. Here, um, I will try to talk about that or I'll ask, answer questions if you want to talk about that during the question period. But it's probably the most egregious area next to ADHD where my own research actually has shown quite clearly that we are wildly overdiagnosing uh, depression. 
So I will leave you there and stop at this point. Thank you. Dr. Wakefield, thank you very much. That was, uh, you gave us a lot to think about. Um, just remember this, the next part of the presentation, we're gonna be taking your questions and using your questions to ask um, our distinguished professors um, their thoughts about uh, the various topics that you're hearing today. So make sure the more clearly you write, the more thankful I will be. So clear and concise, uh, please. And uh, without further ado, uh, Dr. First, you are second, so go for it. <clears throat> well, thank you very much. Uh, so I'm a much more of a practical person. M my career has been involved in creating this book that Dr. Wakefield has been uh, making fun of uh, a little bit. <laughs> so I'm going to talk about, uh, and you can see from the topic, uh, what's the DSM's role in the medicalization of normality. And I, I guess I agree that there's no question that for a lot of the reasons that Dr. Wakefield talked about, there is this trend. I guess I'm going to be very focused on this issue about what's the DSM's contribution to that uh, one way or another. So, so uh, one quick disclosure, I do get royalties from books related to the DSM. So one of the things, in fact, Dr. Wakefield illustrated this problem, which is confusion about what's, what does it mean when something is in the DSM. The DSM uh, is the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual for Mental Disorders, and it, the, that title suggests, perhaps, that everything included in the DSM is a mental disorder. And, and the thing that I was uh, noticed that Dr. Wakefield included is circadian rhythm sleep disorder shift work type. Now, it's very easy to make fun of. Uh, There's also another one I'm surprised Dr. Wakefield didn't pick on jet lag type. That was in there for a while. So having jet lag could be uh, a disorder. Well, you know, it's not a disorder. Uh, circadian rhythm sleep disorder is not a mental disorder. It's in the DSM for one reason. People come see doctors with this complaint. There are people who have who are, you know, bad shift work situations where they keep changing the shift, you know, week to week, and these people are unable to function because of that. They'll go in, they'll go in for an evaluation, maybe not to a psychiatrist, but to a sleep specialist, sometimes a psychiatrist, sometimes a general practitioner. And that person needs to get a code to, to cover, to explain what was the reason for the uh, interaction. And the, the treatment may simply be quit your job or whatever, whatever it might be, but you need to have, there's a real problem. There's nothing that says that that's a mental disorder. It happens to be in the DSM because the DSM includes a section for sleep disorders and it includes lots of things in there like narcolepsy, and sleep apnea. Nobody says that these are mental disorders, but they're there because the DSM is fundamentally a book to help mental health professionals practice on a day-to-day -day basis. Now, unfortunately, that's what it was there for when it got started. The DSM goes all the way back to 1952. DSM-3 in 1980 was the one that became popular. Somehow, because this book has become so popular, people like to look at it as this is the authoritative guide to what's normal and not normal, and that's a problem. So that being in the DSM is not necessarily uh, means it's a mental disorder. And, and there are, as I just was saying, there's lots of non-mental disorders, the sleep disorders, um, and there are things that Dr. Wakefield mentioned, that, uh, that people come in to see a mental health professional for things that aren't disorders, like grief. People come in for counseling because their spouse died, that's going, the person seeing that person needs to have a code to write down on the chart and, and do the treatment. So there's a whole section recognizing the fact that mental health professionals and counselors and other people see people who don't necessarily qualify for a, mental, a medical condition. Uh, there's actually these statements. So they say that there's a whole chapter called Other Conditions That May Be a Focus of Clinical Attention. And in that section, they're defined as conditions and problems that may be a focus of clinical attention or that may otherwise affect the diagnosis, course, prognosis, or treatment of a patient's mental disorder. Um, and these are the kinds of things included in that chapter. All kinds of things like besides bereavement, relationship problems, physical, sexual, and psychological abuse and neglect, religious or spiritual problem, child or adolescent antisocial behavior, phase of life problem, and on and on. These are things that you can imagine. Somebody might walk into a mental health professional or a GP's office with these complaints and that person might need to deal with them and the, nobody is saying that simply because the person walked in that they're going to be getting a disorder. 
Now, what sometimes happens, and I think Dr. Wakefield was indicating this, that the uh, insurance companies of the government, in their wisdom, have, have drawn a line about what they want to pay for. And historically, insurance, medical insurance, exists to treat medical problems. So that has sort of driven the whole, the whole industry. So anything that is a medical condition, insurance companies will cover. Because these things are explicitly labeled as not being conditions, the insurance companies are off the hook and having to cover them. Now, if we lived in a perfect world, and in parts of the world where they don't need a diagnosis for payment, these things would be covered by the healthcare system. I don't think people in uh, Scandinavia are not getting treatment for grief because it's not uh, a disorder. They're getting treatment nonetheless. But in the United States and uh, some other countries, this line is drawn. So what do clinicians do? As uh, Dr. Weif will talk about the clinician's dilemma, people will sometimes make a disorder diagnosis simply to allow the person to get paid, even though in their heart of hearts they know that that person doesn't really have a disorder. So like, these, these codes in this section of the book is rarely used code-wise because nobody gets paid. So there is an unfortunate uh, tendency to pull codes from the rest of the book. So, so, so this is certainly one, as so one aspect of the DSM that I think uh, makes people feel like things are being medicalized is the fact that it includes things that actually are explicitly not psychiatric conditions, but people get confused about what that means. But in fact, there is a real problem here, and, and, and Dr. Wakefield talks about false positives. I'm, I've been in agreement with Dr. Wakefield for years that this is a serious problem, potential problem with the DSM, uh, which is basically labeling something which is not a disorder as a disorder. The problem inside, this is true in all of medicine, but it's even worse in psychiatry, is our disorders are defined by signs and symptoms that are not inherently evidence of psychopathology. So if you go through the DSM, as, as Dr. Wakefield did with ADHD, and pulled out a couple of lines of symptoms, of course those things occur in normal people all the time. So our, the building blocks of the DSM categories are common normal things, anxiety, depression, dissociation, somatic concerns, euphoria, irritability, fixed beliefs, perceptual disturbances. Those are the building blocks of the DSM disorders. But each one of those in isolation is not inherently evidence of psychopathology. The, what makes something a disorder in the DSM is usually two things. Forget the concept that Dr. Wakefield talked about, about harmful dysfunction. That's sort of conceptual, how you think of something as a disorder. But to, the way the DSM is put together, it's lists of symptoms that usually have to have a bunch together. So they group together. It's not just an isolated symptom. It's several symptoms occurring together, but most importantly, Following uh, what Dr. Wakefield talked about the requirement for harm, usually most of the disorders of the DSM have a requirement that it's got to cause clinically significant distress or impairment. The problem, of course, this is entirely clinical judgment. The, the, there's this phrase over and over again in the DSM that it requires clini clinically significant distress or impairment. People have said, well, what, what does that mean, clinically significant? And unfortunately, it's up to the clinician making the diagnosis to decide what does it mean to be clinically significant. So it's a very fuzzy line, which is, means, therefore, that it could be bent and stretched. Uh, so you could have somebody who has some attention problem. They come in, the parent drags them into the doctor, and the doctor, well, it must be clinically significant. The parent is dragging the kid in for help. It's clinically significant, therefore. End of story, it's a disorder. So the built-in judgment here is what, it goes both ways. So theoretically, in the case that Dr. Wakefield's talking about, which is this issue about kids who are younger in the grade are getting diagnosed with ADHD, that's not a DSM problem. That's a clinician problem. People are making the wrong diagnosis because they're not using common sense. If you think about the idea that uh, attentional uh, capacity is a developmental, uh, something that's developmental, you have a certain capacity, younger kids, of course, normally will have less capacity for maintaining attention. The clinician is supposed to put that into account when applying the diagnosis of ADHD. Unfortunately, uh, more often than not, that doesn't always happen. And this, uh, so this clinical judgment goes both ways. It should leap. It can sometimes cause cases to be put in that shouldn't be there, but it also helps keep cases out. Another uh, predisposing quality of the DSM uh, is the fact that the DSM, how many people here, I keep Dr. Wakefield and I keep talking about the DSM. How many people have ever seen the DSM? Are most people familiar with that? Good. So if you haven't, buy it. It's actually, it's, it, the DSM is sold 
maybe number one or number two most best-selling medical book ever. Uh, the la each edition of the DSM sells over a million copies, which is astonishing if you think about the fact that there are only 400,000 male health professionals in the United States. Like, who's buying the book? I mean, nobody quite knows. <laughs> it's patients, families, students. I mean, it's all over the place, but you can see it's really you know, out there. So a lot of people, even if you're not a mental health professional, may be familiar with it. But the, the thing that makes it very appealing is the operationalized criteria. It boils the mystery of psychiatry and psychology into these checklists, which is both its, its strength and a serious advantage. A lot of people have criticized the DSM rightly by the fact that it makes pretend that you can boil the field down. But this makes it prone to the idea that you can develop self-report instruments, computerized interviews, things that leave out the clinical judgment. So the possibility of false positives from a screening test is huge. Um, another asp reason why the DSM will promote medicalization is the whole existence. When the DSM got created in, in 1983, there was a big push at that point for psychiatry to be like the rest of medicine. The psychiatry was marginalized. It was heavily dominated by psychoanalysts. And it was like, we want to be like the rest of the doctors. So the DSM really filled that role. When you opened up the DSM, it looked pretty scientific to have these lists. Looks like it was, you know, came from some wonderful compendium of data. But in fact, it was a, a, a built by experts doing their best to define these conditions. But the actual science behind it was pretty, you know, pretty weak in the beginning. But it looked pretty good, so therefore it looks like other medical conditions. So that's another thing that made the DSM uh, uh, promote medicalization. Um, so let's now talk about, now that I've talked about why it is that the DSM has promoted the possibility of medicalization and false positives, I'm now going to be on the, go to the other side and say, this is, we, we recognize that. This has always been a problem that has been, you know, through different people working on the DSM, uh, looked at more or less carefully. But when I was working on it, we took this very, very seriously, the false positive problem. And the problem is, unfortunately, is the DSM could be used by anybody. You could buy it off the bookshelf. You could diagnose your friends. But the, the idea is, is that it really to use it well, you need clinical judgment. Uh, so we had to figure out what could we do to the, to the DSM and the definitions to prevent it from being misused for medicalization. So um, these are some of the mechanisms that we put in. So the first one is that phrase I kept talking to you about, which is the, this requirement that the disturbance must cause clinically significant distress or impairment. And again, we, the reason we do this is most, let, let me give you a couple of examples. Like something like shyness is a good example, and, and, and social anxiety disorder, ADHD for that matter, or autism. Take virtually any uh, disorder, like autism, social anxiety disorder, depression, they occur on a continuum. There's no bright line separating shyness from social anxiety disorder or geeky kid from autism spectrum disorder. The, the, what we use for that is some decision that when it crosses a certain point, there's enough harm that we're going to call it a disorder. So this criterion has a huge uh, uh, sort of job within the DSM in trying to set this boundary between disorder and non-disorder. And this is in contrast to medicine. People have, have picked on this as something which makes psychiatry a little bit ludicrous. For example, you would not make a diagnosis of tuberculosis and require the patient to be in pain or, or, or having some harm to make the diagnosis. If you're having the infection, it's called tuberculosis. This requirement of some kind of role impairment is something which is unique to psychiatry. And we all recognize that that's a weakness of the DSM in psychiatry, but there's no other way right now to be able to uh, differentiate normal from a disordered. Now, the other mechanism that the DSM has used uh, to try to help differentiate normal from disorder is the idea of considering context. And the idea is, is that, so we're looking, we're taking things like anxiety. We all know that anxiety is normal. Everybody experiences anxiety all the time. But if the anxiety occurs in a situation where it doesn't make sense, then we consider it a disorder. So something like generalized anxiety disorder. The person is anxious all the time, no matter what, and they're anxious and worried about insignificant, unrealistic things. Somehow, in that person, their anxiety has become untethered from their context. 
So that's a marker in general for when a symptom smells like it's a disorder rather than just being something normal. So the way the DSM deals with that is this, so what's really going on here, and you can see in the example I gave you, is, is that you have to look for when the symptom is untethered from its context. So there are several examples. So here's three examples from the DSM that show you that. So when you have the concept of a hallucination, when you have a, it's normal to have a perception, but if you're having a perception without an actual stimulus to trigger it, then we have the, the perception is untethered from the context of a stimulus. Extreme fear in the absence of danger is the core idea of how you di diagnose a panic attack or a phobia. And separation anxiety, when it occurs in the absence of a bond disruption, that's again a marker of a disorder. So DSM tries hard to use sort of institutionalize the common sense to try to differentiate disorder from non-disorder. So there's lots of conditions, like kleptomania is an example of a condition. Obviously, stealing is not evidence of a mental disorder. It can be, but not necessarily. So in the definition of kleptomania, we know we don't want to be labeling people with kleptomania if the person is stealing to express anger or vengeance. So we're, we're trying, so sometimes some of our disorders have phrases in there where if we have something that we know is clearly evidence of a, of a non-disorder, we'll explicitly put it in there. Uh, some disorders, two disorders in particular, there's a disorder in the DSM called intermittent explosive disorder, which is recurrent outbursts of verbal or physical aggression. Again, lots of people do that under all kinds of different contexts. <laughs> Too much alcohol, just being irritated. But this particular, to, to make this a disorder from the DSM perspective, a requirement is, is that the aggressiveness has to be grossly out of proportion to the provocation. So this is the person if you're driving, you cut them off, they get out of the car and they start smashing your car because that little provocation triggers this uh, out of proportion reaction. A specific phobia, by definition, if you're faced with a tiger in front of you and you're feeling frightened, that's normal. If you're feeling uh, frightened of a little mouse uh, that's on the other side of the room and you're, you're, you're out of control of fear, there's an example where the fear that that person has experienced is out of proportion to the actual danger. So that's why we would consider that a disorder. Then getting into this issue, another important thing is many of our symptoms are normal depending upon the age. Separation anxiety is normal in a two-year-old. You would never on its own call a two-year-old having separation anxiety disorder if, it, if it's within what you normally see on a, in a two-year-old. So the definition of separation anxiety disorder in the DSM specifically requires that it be developmentally inappropriate uh, for that person's age. This is also true for ADHD. ADHD, there's a clause in there as well saying this is, it's normal for kids at a certain age to have trouble sitting still. Uh, you have to make a judgment. This is out of proportion to what you'd expect. Um, enuresis, which is bedwetting, is a, another good example. It would be ridiculous to label a four-year-old as having bedwetting because the capacity to control, to hold your urine overnight isn't developed until age five. So you wouldn't make the diagnosis if it's developmentally inappropriate to do so. Uh, so another strategy that the DSM uses is to require a symptom to occur in multiple contexts. So ADHD requires that symptoms occur in two or more settings. The reason that's important here is, is that uh, if it's really a problem and it's really from the individual, you wouldn't expect it just to be in one setting. If it's school and not at home, it makes you wonder whether the real problem is the school. You know, there's something about that schooling that's really not stimulating enough. You'd like to see it in multiple settings. That's a marker of validity, that it's not a false positive. Um, Another example is a requirement for a degree of discrepancy between the patient's belief system and, and external reality. What I mean by that is a condition called body dysmorphic disorder, where a person is preoccupied by what they believe to be a defect in their appearance. Now, if somebody has uh, a birth defect that makes them deformed and they're embarrassed and preoccupied about it, we wouldn't consider that a disorder because you'd expect that. But the, the requirement in body dysmorphic disorder is if somebody walks into your office saying that I'm horribly embarrassed by this defect, and you look at them and you can't see it at all. They look fine to you. That's the marker that this is disordered. Um, now, it is true. There's a, I'm sure people here are somewhat aware of the D 
DSM-5 saga of development, there were lots of criticisms about the possibility that the DSM was expanding false positives rather than contracting. I just gave you a whole bunch of strategies to try to keep the false positives under control, but at least some of the criticism that was uh, proposed for DSM-5 were changes that might have expanded false positives. Now, anytime you add a new category to the DSM, those are the biggest risks of false positives. So, because uh, basically what it does is it, the idea when you add a new category to the DSM is cases that were previously undiagnosed will now be diagnosed and labeled as a new disorder. So obviously, if that, those cases were normal in the first place, then you're going to have um, a disorder. And the other thing is, is, I mentioned before, that one of the way the DSM makes diagnoses is we have you count up the number of symptoms that are present. And if you lower the requirement, you're going to potentially increase false positives. So let me give you a couple of examples in DSM-5. There's a new disorder that was added called social communication disorder. And this is the definition. Persistent difficulties in the social use of verbal and nonverbal communication in non-literal or ambiguous meaning of language. So somebody that's unable to understand jokes, um, or making in, uh, inferences. So you can see right off the bat, lots of people may not have trouble picking up on jokes. So that's a, uh, the, you know, or, or, you know, geek, you know, people who are socially awkward. That's why I call it geeky child here. So this, the normal case is the geeky child, but we have this disorder in the DSM called social communication disorder. The requirement, the thing that helps make this a disorder is the requirement that it results in functional limitations. Another new disorder that was added to DSM-5, which is a real focus of concern, is something called disruptive mood dysregulation disorder. And the normal variant of that is what we call bratty kid. So the definition is severe recurrent temper outbursts with persistently irritable or angry mood in between the outbursts. So that's the basic definition. What they tried to do to elevate it above just a bratty kid is, is the requirements of the outbursts are grossly out of proportion, are inconsistent with developmental level, and occur in two out of three settings. So they tried to up the, uh, also the number of outbursts that are required for this is actually pretty high. Hoarding disorder is another new disorder in the DSM. Again, whenever you have a new disorder in there, there's the potential for false positives, especially something like this. Lots of people collect all kinds of things and fill their houses with it. So as soon as this disorder is added, there's this risk of that people who are just simply collectors might be labeled as having a disorder. So the actual definition is difficulty. To, now, it turns out that even though we think of hoarders as collectors, the actual definition of hoarding disorder focuses not on the collecting, which is inherently normal, but this difficulty discarding or parting with possessions. I'm not saying that's necessarily not that normal, too. But the focus is, is on this, because what makes it a disorder is this combination. Difficulty discarding or parting with possessions and that results in, the, in, the, in an accumulation of stuff which clutters the living area so much so that they compromise their intended use. So this is the person who fills their house with stuff so they can barely get around. It's not just the person who is, likes to, has trouble throwing things out. And then another disorder that was criticized, a uh, binge eating disorder. A uh, binge eating disorder is like bulimia nervosa without the purging and, um, and excessive exercise. So it's just the binging. So you get into this blurry thing here about what's the boundary between overeating and being obese and having binge eating disorder. And it was partly criticized by the threshold that was set in the DSM was actually uh, uh, pretty low. Basically, once a week for three months of a binge was enough to call it binge eating disorder, even though they do have the requirement that causes marked distress. But in this case, that's probably not that helpful in getting, you know, uh, getting, keeping normal people out of that. Now, I did mention about the lowering the threshold. There are two examples where DSM-5 lowered the number of symptoms required. Dr. Wakefield already talked a little bit about adult ADHD. So ADHD is, you usually think of as a childhood disorder. And it is a childhood disorder, but when you're a child with ADHD and you grow up to be an adult, you can therefore have an adult, you can be an adult with ADHD. And the reason it, it's called adult ADHD, these are people who weren't recognized as having ADHD in childhood. Even though now there's, you know, ADHD is all the rage, 20, 30, 40 years ago, ADHD was much less recognized. So there really are a number of people out there who suffered through their childhood with undiagnosed ADHD that are only being diagnosed now that they're adults. So that's the concept of adult ADHD. But DSM decided uh, in a very controversial way to reduce the number of symptoms required for adult ADHD from six out of nine to five out of nine. 
So clearly, when, when the DSM does stuff like that, they are flirting with the possibility of increasing the risk of false positives. And then substance use disorder um, was also a pretty big change. It went from 3 out of 7 to 2 out of 11. That's a pretty big drop. And a lot of people have wondered, and there's some evidence suggesting, that substance use disorder in DSM-5 may have a significant number of false positives. Uh, how much time do I have left? Out of time. Yeah. Okay, I'll stop here. Two more minutes. Just, two more minutes. I'll just say, the last thing I was going to say, I was, I was going to talk about this issue of epidemics and psychiatry. Um, and, and like people are talking about epidemic of ADHD, an epidemic of autism. Uh, one of the problems is it's very hard to know what, when the actual incidence is increasing versus whether people are coming into treatment. Like, like autism is a good example. You know, the, the whole vaccine thing and lots of these other environmental suspicions about the causes of autism comes from the fact that all of a sudden, out of nowhere, the rates of autism have exploded. How much of that is due to the fact that autism is becoming more prevalent versus people, parents bringing their kids in for treatment with that label because they're more familiar with it? So getting into treatment and, and uh, all the factors that bring people to treatment make it very difficult to know what's a real epidemic uh, in the sense of an actual increase in prevalence versus an apparent epidemic simply because people are, uh, are brought in. And let me just jump to ADHD. So it is true, for example, that there was a study that was done that between 2003 and 2011, ADHD cases went up 42% in uh, diagnoses in children ages 4 to 7. So that, that's a significant increase. I mean, it's hard to say that and feel that that's a real increase in prevalence. That's almost certainly due to the fact that parents are bringing in their, uh, the kids more often for help. And, and my, the point of this slide is, is that, so what's the role of the DSM? Well, it turns out that from that period of time, from 2003 to 2011, the DSM criteria for ADHD hadn't changed. It was stable. So if you're going, so from 1994 to 2013, the criteria were unchanged, because that was a very big gap between versions of the DSM. So, my point here is, is that you can't, while the DSA may have something to do with some of this, clearly something else is going on. If the definition is unchanged, it really argues that other factors, uh, like parents wanting their kids to get medicated because it's easier to throw medicine at them to get them to behave, or whether they want to give them an edge in testing, or all the possible reasons why somebody might want to get a diagnosis. So it's very, it's the whole general issue about what the role of the DSM is in medicalization is complicated because the users of the DSM, whether it's the doctors or the family members or the patients themselves, are often a big driver on coming in for treatment. So I will stop here and we will open it up now for uh, general discussion. Thank you very much for your attention. Up here. Well, Dr. Wakefield and Dr. First get uh, situated. One of the, I just wanted to uh, remind you that uh, to mark your calendars, March 27th, 2017, the Ethics of Physician Assisted Death. And so this is a, a new topic that um, not only is uh, an issue in the United States, but worldwide as well. And this actually um, impacts psychiatric care, we're seeing countries, uh, especially over in Europe and Eastern Europe, where they have psychiatric panels for people who have severe depression or severe um, mental health disorders um, being um, evaluated if they are able to consent for physician-assisted death. So a very interesting topic, um, especially in the state of Michigan um, when we had to go through the process with uh, Dr. Jack Kevorkian. So on uh, March uh, 27th, 2017, um, and the speaker will be Robert, Dr. Robert Arnold from the University of Pittsburgh and Dr. Timothy Quill, University of Rochester School of Medicine. But uh, now let's get started and we'll ask some questions. For the next 35, 40 minutes, we're gonna go through some written questions and after that, we're gonna have some uh, live questions and we'll have the mics open for questions. So first question, um, and this is uh, probably a good question for, for both, but we'll start with Dr. Wakefield. Uh, does the healthcare system of the United States make us more inclined to medicalize everyday problems so that providers can, uh, can assure getting paid for their work? That's easy to answer. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the answer is obviously yes. 
um, in many other healthcare systems in uh, developed countries, you don't have this kind of um, parsing of the diagnosis. In fact, in some countries, you don't even have to give a diagnosis for most cases that you treat, if you're a psychiatrist, for instance. Um, but, or there might be like in, in France, there's certain special categories which are more expensive, which you have to specify, but it's much more open. Um, because we are so focused on medical necessity and on keeping a certain threshold in place, um, I think clinicians have overwhelming pressures to uh, diagnose uh, and overdiagnose in order to justify helping people that need help. Look, I will bet that many of you in this room have had relationship problems where you have gone to somebody. Relationship problems are not covered under most reimbursement systems in this country, yet that's self-defeating, right? If you want to keep a relationship together, that relationship might have children involved. Isn't it self-defeating and foolish? The, th the clinician wants to help, so maybe stretching it a little or interpreting the symptoms so they fit, this partner might have mm, generalized anxiety disorder as a result of the partners arguing all the time. This one looks like they might have uh, major depression uh, and so on. So you will get these kinds of diagnoses that are out of a pressure for reimbursement all the time. And my only comment is, is that unfortunately we know that there's a huge pressure to control health care costs in the United States, which are exploding. And somehow, unfortunately, for a long time, the insurance industry has used this blunt instrument, which is deciding what's a disorder or not a disorder, making it clear what that is, and basically forcing clinicians to have to shade things around that. So I think there's no question that this, our system has helped uh, create this problem. Uh, and, and this question kind of goes along with that question. Discuss how health insurance has contributed to medicalization. Um, for example, increased treatment with medications rather than more evidence-based treatments that require longer treatment sessions and treatment trajectories to be successful. Dr. First, I'll get you the first shot at that one. Well, that's also true. Well, that's a general, the general issue of push towards medication. So there is a, the, part of it is the insurance companies are favoring it's very difficult to get coverage for psychotherapy. It's not so hard to get your GP covered to give you Prozac. So that fundamental bias in the insurance system is clearly going to put pressure on people seeing these or wanting to see these things as things that could be treated with medication rather than with talk therapy. So you're right. So this is our insurance system is clearly pushing treatment into a certain direction. It's inherently more medicalized. You don't, you know, you can see psychotherapy works for both the disorder depression, but it also works for grief and sadness, so that it's a, a much broader thing. You don't give pills to somebody who is not disordered, so by making pills the only option for many people, of course you're going to be pushing people into being given a, a medicalized uh, label. It's also, I would, I would just add to that, I agree with everything that uh, Dr. First said, but I would add to that, um, the pressure for evidence-based practice, which is a reasonable one in some regards, uh, also leads to the, to the conclusion that, uh, at, at one point it led to the conclusion that pharmacological interventions had been studied better, could be um, um, administered in a more research-anchored way, in a more clear-cut way, and the idea was out there that we have to bring psychotherapy around to that level of precision. How many sessions for how long fit this particular case? You've got to titrate the psychotherapy like you would titrate uh, a medication. Uh, this is a little unrealistic, but we've heard it even within the last year from, from uh, one of the heads of uh, the NIMH. Um, so um, I think that has been pressuring things, but the reality, just to say reality for a second, reality is that in almost every area, psychotherapies, multiple psychotherapies, have been shown to be just as effective as medication. The reality is this, this is a, um, a kind of stranglehold that the um, pharmacological producers and the system have on clinicians, pressuring them in a certain direction, when in fact the efficacy of treatment is known to be equal or better in some instances with psychotherapy. So it's, I think it's an un, at this point where the evidence isn't all in, 
you can argue it, but it seems to me an unjust bias of the system at this point. Uh, next question. I'm going to add a little bit on to this question, so my apologies to the writer, but um, do you anticipate better tools? I'm going to uh, direct this one more to Dr. First because I anticipate during the development of the DSM that this came up uh, probably at least several times. Um, do you anticipate better tools for diagnosis in the near future, i.e. MRI with enhanced uptake in specific areas of the brain? How far off? And, and in terms of biomarkers, uh, psychogenomics, and other um, strategies for diagnosis and, and treatment, how, how far off or how much do you see that influence in, in the near future or distant future? I can't tell you how much I wish I could give you an answer where we were just around the corner. Uh, we are unfortunately very, very far away. You think it's a little counterintuitive. You, you see brain scans and you think, for example, that we know that p patients with schizophrenia on average have a certain brain findings compared to normals. That doesn't help you when you're diagnosing an individual. Now, if there are people, even within right now, people who are pushing for the use of neuroimaging, claiming it helps. But right now, uh, unfortunately, all the things you mentioned, brain imaging, biomarkers, uh, they were desperate during the development of DSM-5 to get a biomarker in the DSM. And there's only one biomarker in the DSM, and the diagnosis that has it is narcolepsy, which is not a mental disorder. Uh, and actually, literally, in the criteria for narcolepsy, there's a cerebral spinal fluid assay for hypocretin that's low in narcolepsy, which is, a, you know, we want that for everything. Unfortunately, it doesn't exist. I, you know, I, I very reluctant to predict when that will happen. Uh, uh, but the hope is, hopefully in my lifetime, we'll have that. But we're, very, we're still very far away. That'll, that would change things. I mean, I think that the reliance on subjective symptom reporting, I mean, some of the concern about the overdiagnosis, if we had really good biomarkers to help us know what's disorder versus non-disorder, not that that solves the problem, but that would help a lot. So, you know, it's the lack of that kind of hard biologically based data that would and from Dr. Wakefield's perspective, if you look at harmful dysfunction, that's the marker for dysfunction. If you actually had an objective marker, that would be really helpful, but we don't have that. So I think that would help with this problem, but the lack of the tools um, keeps us there from going there. Uh, next, go ahead. Okay. I, mean, I mean, I think I, I just agree that there's no biomarker information that isn't so fuzzy that it uh, does more harm than good when you use it for diagnosis as of now. Someday we may have that, but keep in mind that that is, I, Michael's absolutely right, that, that the, um, the biomarker will help tell us perhaps if there is a dysfunction inside. But you're still going to need the clinical criteria to tell you if the, it is a harmful dysfunction. We know of many biomarkers in physical medicine for which there is something wrong with something, but only 1% of all those cases have any clinical disorder. So you can't, there's no magic here. You're going to always be looking at the meaning of the biomarker in that individual's life to make your final, to draw your final conclusion about whether there is a disorder. That's, I guess, the harm component is whether it actually has an impact on the person's life. We may actually have to still talk to our patients. That's kind of sounds, sounds good. <laughs> yeah. um, this question is directed to Dr. Wakefield. Um, could you say more, first, uh, thank you for your thought-provoking talk. Um, could you say more about psychological justice and why this justifies intervention of the kind you described? Okay. And does not merely explain it. Yeah. Um, look, uh, I didn't have time to say it all, but you can see where I'm going. I said that I find our current reimbursement system to be self-defeating and somewhat cruel. How could it ever be expanded? What would be the argument by which it might be expanded? And if you look around at arguments, I only, I, I mean, there are various possible arguments, but one has been successful. There's one argument out there for extending medical treatment beyond medical necessity that has been unbelievably powerfully successful. And that is injustice in terms of our economic system. If you look at Supreme Court rulings, I'm going by here by the discussions of, of the justices. And in this case, interestingly, especially the female Supreme Court justices, 
where they discuss why it is that it is essential for the medical system to provide contraceptive technology to women, for instance, and other reproductive benefits that have to do with regulating reproduction that has nothing to do with disorder. Contraceptive is, is not about disorder. So why is that? And if you look at the various opinions that they've put forward, the reason it turns out that's given is in terms of justice. And I'm not going to go on a riff here about John Rawls and how it fits with medicine and so on. I think it's very interesting, but how theories of justice could fit in here. Um, I've written something about that. But the point is, the rationale is that if our system um, is such that we construct it in a way that opportunity, the opportunity to partake and to advance yourself is foreclosed under a wide variety of circumstances that we can help you out of, then we owe it to individuals to help them. And women in particular in a system like ours where there's equal involvement in occupational um, um, careers and equal interest in success, equal benefit of the system to having everybody involved, the argument has been by these justices that that justifies on non-medical grounds the essential nature of, of that, the med that medical insurance must cover these kinds of uh, provisions for women. Now, just taking that without going into that further, I mean, I see that as an analogous argument to the one I'm mounting for mental health. I see psychological properties that are normal variants that are, di are extremely disadvantageous. And are, I tried to give a couple of examples, such as you know, inability to engage in mass communication in our mass communication society, for which we're not evolved, and so on. But you can see many of them, ADHD, inability to gain an unnatural level of stillness in school and, and focus uh, beyond what children are probably evolved for, but, um, but some are talented at and some aren't. All these things have become crucial to our culture's demands on people in terms of economic involvement and success, ultimately, including education, of course. I'll give many other examples. But they're not medical problems because what they are is they are part of the normal curve that we have to some degree excluded. So they're not medical necessity, strictly speaking. What I see is an analogous argument for extending and reimbursement, at least to those areas where, as a society, we make it difficult for people to succeed. So I hope that answers the question in the way that it was asked, in terms of what my rationale is and expanding on the notion of psychological justice. Psychological justice is providing those, the, the opportunity to develop those psychological properties that we demand of people to have opportunity in the society we've constructed. Dr. First, the next question is uh, directed uh, for you. Thank you for your thought-provoking talk. If overdiagnosis is not an issue rooted in the DSM, but a misuse or misunderstanding of the text by clinicians, why is there so much misuse understanding, especially given the DSM's role in making psychiatric, psychiatry more medical? Well, uh, the problem with the DSM is that it's a book that you buy and you use. So there's a, very, there's a limit to what the DSM can do to make sure it's used well. You know, everything I talked about were our attempts to build into the, at least the definitions to try to make people do less stupid things or <laughs> smart, smart things. Like the bereavement exclusion, unfortunately, which was eliminated uh, to Dr. First, uh, Dr. Wakefield and my chagrin, but that was there, to put it bluntly, was to keep, you know, your spouse, a uh, person comes in, <laughs> spouse died, they seem depressed. A stupid thing would be to say, oh, they have major depression, I'll give them a medication. The smart thing is to say, wait a minute, this is normal grief. So it's putting it in as a criterion, as a way to put a red flag, do the right thing and think smartly. The problem is people you know, still do what they want. And the ADHD is a good example. You know, people will write down a diagnosis because that's what they think they want to do, they need to do, and they don't read it that carefully. So, uh, that's why I, I, we, we try, now, it's people, I'm not saying the DSM, there's nothing in there, you know, in fact, uh, the, every time you add a new diagnosis, I'm not saying everything in there is perfect and could be leading to overdiagnosis, including the getting rid of the bereavement exclusion. So there's things that were done 
that still could be improved in the DSM to help. But I think, I still believe that the bigger problem is some kind of educational effort. I'm not sure exactly. It could be educational. There's, you know, unfortunately, you, there's no, you don't have to take a test to use the DSM. It's, you use it because you want to use it. So if there was maybe some kind of educational effort in residency programs and training about false positives, I mean, there's things that could be done to take this more seriously, but it's got to be done on the, 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 the user level, not the book level. The book, I think, there's a limit to what the book can do to get, it, get people to behave better. Well, I, I think there's a, you know, a slight point of disagreement here. I, I do agree with uh, Dr. First's you know, uh, account of how DSM tries to prevent false positives because you know, these are smart folks who are clinicians. They, they can see certain obvious objections. The people who write, these, write out these definitions are not philosophers. They're not conceptual analysts. They haven't been trained in the notion of necessary and sufficient conditions. It's much easier, of course, to come up with um, necessary conditions. Well, to have an anxiety disorder, you have to have intense anxiety. But what about all the conditions that make it sufficient that distinguish it from all the range of circumstances where you have intense anxiety, but it's not a disorder. Well, that's not so easy. Yes, it's true that if it's out of proportion to the actual danger, that helps. But guess what? Your smoke detector goes off when the fish is frying in the oven. It goes off out of proportion to the actual fire in your apartment, and that's good. There's some areas of life where we biologically have been selected to be over-responsive. We are anxious, vigilant creatures. Uh, I was once in a pool at my mom's house in uh, Boca, and uh, a, snake, uh, a, a snake jumped into the pool with me. I could see right away that it was a garter snake. It's harmless. I discovered I could fly. It was amazing. Yeah. <laughs> I, I was like out of the pool, straight up in the air, off to the side. So that fear response to snakes doesn't stop for a moment and say, oh, is this a dangerous snake? How proportionate is my fear to the snake? In other words, you've got to look. This is an Aristotelian vision that reason you know, uh, regulates all of our other emotions and so on. There's a certain truth to that in a way. But on the other hand, when it comes to psychiatry, you've got to look beyond that. And it, it seems to me that Michael has made very good points about this. But saying that there's some good things in DSM doesn't, I think, um, undermine the many objections one can bring. There's still many, many, many serious problems there. I wish I, told my, I wish I could go through his slide set and give you the other side of these various disorders, <laughs> the things that they didn't do that were left that are stupid. Um, but um, also, there's another, another kind of point to be made. The fact that the diagnostic criteria stayed constant during a certain period and diagnosis went up does not mean that DSM is not part of the fault. That's just a fallacy. What it means is that DSM diagnosis as written on the page interacted with something else. The fact that it could happen was made possible by the DSM criteria. The fact that pharmacological, uh, you know, uh, that direct-to-consumer advertising exploited that over the, that period, the fact that parents came in and physicians could exploit that easily during that period. There's a lot of factors which interact with these criteria. If the criteria are broad enough, yes, you can interact with them in a way that gives rise to this huge false positives problem, even while the criteria stay the same. It does take time also for the possibility of exploiting criteria to become known, understood by clinicians and percolating out, and for the motivation to be there, such as um, uh, support of alternative education, special education, and so on. So, um, it, it, Dr. Wakefield, you yes, beat me to okay. it. I'm going to um, Go direct to consumer, Absolutely. and I have one more question. It was actually one of the more popular questions we had. I want to talk about the direct consumer prescribing, and um, I'm going to uh, you brought that up, and that was one of the questions. Um, Dr. First, um, what are your thoughts on that? Do you think that that had an effect as well, um, direct to consumer um, um, advertising by the pharmaceutical industry? I, I think that direct to consumer advertising is a disaster. Mm -hmm. We're one of the only countries in the world that allow that. I, if I were president, I'm not debating tonight, I would roll that back in a second, but that's a problem. So 
the, but I think it's a problem. I think the pro one of the big problems, director consumer, though, is the healthcare cost problem, which is getting get, keeping people away from using generic drugs for the most expensive stuff. Now, how it's uh, how that's affecting it help. It does have some impact here because, like, where is this? Like, Dr. Wakefield kind of hinted about this. You know, wh what is bringing the parents and people into their doctors to ask for treatment, like social anxiety disorder? So, when social the social anxiety disorder. Uh, several SSRIs like Prozac got approved for social anxiety disorder. It wasn't Prozac, it was Zoloft, I think. That drug company went to town running ads, putting ads of a checklist based on the DSM definition. Do you have this? If so, see your doctor. And so people come into the doctor, and the doctors are busy, and they're going to, especially if you're a GP, they'll just write the prescription. So I think that the, there's no question that the pharmaceutical industry, for their own financial reasons, has definitely had a huge negative impact on the medicalization by manipulating the consumers to see this in a way that is medical for their own benefit. So I, I agree. I think that's only part of the problem, but that's the most, I, the advantages of direct-to-consumer advertising are minimal. I mean, it does potentially uncover unrecognized cases, so I won't, I won't say there's no, but the, if you do the cost-benefit analysis, I think it's, it's a big mistake. Yeah. Um, Nick. I mean, this is a good example where DSM interacts. So, and I think, I don't think Dr. Verse would disagree with this. I mean, so the DSM, as he pointed out, creates a set of criteria. Like maybe, like for depression, it's nine symptoms. And you have to have five out of those nine symptoms. So that's a pretty good threshold. But the symptoms differ in their severity or <coughs> what I call pathosuggestiveness. They differ in how much they suggest a pathology versus a normal reaction of sadness. Now, so they, and they just consider them all equal. So. The, far, the, the, the big farmer comes in and says, well, look, we can present ads with the five most um, non-pathosuggestive symptoms, and that's going to suggest to all the people out there that when they're sad, they should come in and see their physician. Look, if you're feeling sad, you've lost interest in stuff, you're having some insomnia, your appetite is less, you've, you're having trouble concentrating, those are all general distress symptoms when things go wrong in your life. They're not suicidal ideation, they're not psychomotor retardation, they're not marked role impairment where you're lying in bed unable to function. But you can orient ads, and this is what the pharmaceutical industry does, and they don't think they're doing anything wrong. They're saying, the psychiatrist told us this is disorder, so we're just trying to you know, use that to help people. And so if DSM were more careful about that, it seems to me, there wouldn't be that ease of use where you could create ads out of weak symptoms that then have this very broad kind of encompassing quality. So here's a, a case that illustrates the interaction of maybe insufficiently incisive criteria with other actors that can use that. It's, it's, it's exploitation, but it's using what's there. So you would suggest that the pharmaceutical companies are, uh, know how to market and they know that medications with the letters P, Q, X, Y, and Z sell better and sound more scientific <laughs> and that medications in purple packages sell better. That might be true. That may be true. Um, this was a popular question, I think, because we ran out of time in your um, lecture and presentation. Um, give us more information about, there was several questions of this version, about the overdiagnosis of depression. How do you differentiate appropriate sadness due to a life circumstances from clinical depression? Isn't this a huge gray area? And I think we just didn't have time to get to that in your presentation. So yeah. I'm going to let both of you comment on that, and then we're going to go to a live mic okay. after that. Uh, well, it follows on what I just said in a way. I, uh, it's too huge to go into all, obviously, but the, um, it, it is a gray area. But here's what we do know. We do know from many, many studies that normal grief, the people chosen that they weren't clinically coming in or anything, they were relatives of people who had just been lost, studying that sequelae of grief, that it includes many of the weaker symptoms. I was just distinguishing the weaker, I call them the general distress symptoms of depression from the pathosuggestive, more serious symptoms of depression. So what it turns out is, is that those uh, general distress symptoms are extremely common in reactions to loss, reactions to stress. Now, you can do research on this, and I've done research on this. I've probably done more studies on this than any other person alive. And it turns out, if you have people that only have those weaker symptoms, they are not anything like all the rest of the people that come under major depression that have some, one or more of those 
stronger pathosuggestive symptoms. For instance, the classic quality of depression, of major depression, is recurrence. You're likely to have recurrences. Uh, another quality is likely much higher rate of suicide attempt. And there's others, you know, development of generalized anxieties, a lot of other markers, predictive markers, the most powerful kind, predictive markers. You can study the people who have only the weaker systems, they qualify under DSM, but they have only the weaker systems and get symptoms, and guess what? Uh, so far we've gotten it to a three, we did a one-year follow-up and a three-year follow-up. On the three-year follow-up, they do not look different than the general population of those who never had major depression. Whereas the people with major depression, of course, look radically different. They have very high rates, just as we all believe all along, they have very high rates of all of those markers, follow-up outcomes. So the research is fairly clear. How do you distinguish? You look at the environmental context. Dr. First pointed that out. We've both worked on that. Um, it's critical. It's left out of DSM in many places. You look at the context. You look at the person's history. And you look at the actual quality of the symptoms rather than counting the way that DSM suggests you should. The quality of the symptoms matters. And you can, I can if you email me, I can send you, you know, some papers or research on this. Uh, so there is a lot of research supporting the fact that there is an overdiagnosis going on here. Dr. First, any thoughts on? Uh, Dr. Wakefield and I have had a little disagreement about. It is true that in epidemiological samples, when you apply these criteria, you see the criteria overdiagnosed according to Dr. Wakefield. Whether this actually means that people are being overdiagnosed with depression in the real world for coming to doctors asking for help, that's unknown. So I, I think that I think you've got to be careful. I'm not saying there's not a problem, but I think that uh, the actual impact and whether people are getting so from from this statement, people are imagining there's millions of people out there taking medicine they don't need. That would be I uh, think too much of a stretch to know the answer to that question. I agree. We don't know the answer to that question. It is true that clinically, by far the most people that are seen are classified under other scales, not using that division I just described as mild. Uh, or moderate, not severe. And we know that antidepressants don't even work all that well with that group, or at least it seems that. So um, if you do careful studies, not the kind of cross-sectional study, remember all your symptoms through your life, but you follow people asking them every few years, what happened this year? So they've got fresh memories and so on. The current criteria in DSM for major depression apply to apparently more than half of the entire population at some point between about 18, ages 18 and 30. Uh, there's nothing in the conceptualization of this disorder that ever suggested that. It just looks like we have, we are massively potentially overdiagnosing. but Michael's absolutely right. We have not done the studies to show, in terms of who comes in clinically, what percentage there are false positives and aren't. We just don't know any of that yet. We're going to switch gears to some live questions. So um, if, if you have a question, please um, raise your hand um, or come to the mic. And, um, and please um, tell us your name um, so that um, we can reference you. Hi. Thank you very much. My name is Jeff Burns. Uh, so directed toward Dr. First. So you gave us some very helpful clarifications in a kind of rough defense of the uh, DSM. And the clarifications are something like, look, not everything listed is a disorder. Not everything is outlined concretely, but there's room for clinical interpretation. And look, even when criteria don't change, you might see an uptick in people seeking data. But even if that works as a defense of the text, I mean, I wonder if that doesn't provoke the cultural question. If people see a text that could play Linnaeus to all mental phenomena, it can encode everything. And that even in the interpretive work can only be done by, to put it most polemically, like a kind of priesthood of people who know about these things. And it seems like, you know, the text or the culture around the text could be feeding into this kind of problem. Well, I think you're right. Um, the book, you know, let me just give you a little anecdote. I mean, I didn't work that much. I, I worked very heavily on DSM-4, the one that I, uh, where we were very caring about false positives. The next crew of people who took over the DSM-5, 
interestingly enough, they didn't care that much about false positives. They, in fact, I, 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 so several of them actually, when these issues were raised to them about false positives, they said, well, that's not our job to worry about how it could be misused. And I, I'm, my response is the opposite. You're right, we've now created a tool which is easily misused. So I, I think you're absolutely right. DSM and the APA has a responsibility to do whatever it can to keep, make the book as abuse-proof as possible, however difficult that is. So my, my point about the rates going up, even the criteria, was sort of a, a point that there's a limit to what we can do. That the, that's not the core of the problem. But I'm not saying absolving, washing my hands of it and say, we're going to put it out there. It's clinicians' responsibility to use it right. I think we do have a responsibility, not put in stupid disorders, not put in really low thresholds, and, you know, and sort of do the best we can. So I, I, I sort of went it both ways. My name is Brian Lakey, uh, Professor Wakefield. I admire your work on um, bereavement and diagnoses of major depression, and, and Professor First, I admire the DSM. It's a required textbook in my 300-level psychopathology uh, class. Uh, the question that I have has to do with many of the premises of the discussion assume that there is a, a clear criterion for mental disorders to compare to diagnoses with. And it seemed to me that, Professor Wakefield, you were, you were arguing that, um, that the DSM assumes that uh, there's a primary biological cause for all disorders. But in my reading, the DSM doesn't actually say that. And in fact, lists stressful life events as an ideological factor for more disorders than there's actually good evidence for. Uh, I wasn't clear, actually, on what your opinion was on this, Professor, at first. In, in some ways, uh, it seemed to me that you were saying, if we could find the biomarkers, then the problem would be solved. So here I'm ramping up to the question is, uh, can either of you offer a definition of a mental disorder that does not rely upon a primary biological dysfunction? I think actually the current definition says biological or psychological. The key word is dysfunction. Yeah. Whether, no, it's, not, it's not required that only biological dysfunctions count. There has to be a dysfunction of some sort. I think we commonly, and I, part of it does have to do with this you know, decade of the brain. I mean, there's been a push to see, especially in psychiatry, part of it is so it can be like the rest of medicine, to see things in biological reductionistic terms. But I think that in the current, I don't know how many people here are familiar with RDOC, it's the new NIMH, you know, replacement, so to speak, for research for, for understanding the brain, where they've broken down uh, mental disorders into psychological functions that by definition have a neurobiological cause because they're neurocircuitry based. So that's one way of looking at it. And I think the DSM is open to both. So I think it would be a mistake to, see, to say that everything has a core biological. My comment of the biomarkers was more that, you know, as a doctor, we love biomarkers because we, you know, people want blood tests to tell us things. So that would help. I, I, don't, I don't want to imply that will solve all the problems. But I guess given the drought of biomarkers, any biomarker that comes our way, I think, would be an improvement. I think this, uh, first of all, let me just say, I, and I'm not sure, but it may be that what you're asking about is actually reflecting um, uh, an ambiguity in the word biological. That is, I personally don't believe that every disorder must have, must go back to a dysfunction that's describable in reductionistic, if you want to use that word, brain physiological terms. Now, today, so biological can have two meanings to me. Biological can mean, oh, it's got to be a brain thing that's gone wrong. Or biological can mean evolutionary biological, which means simply something's going wrong at some level that is not doing what it's supposed to do by biological design without getting into that whole discussion. Um, so to me, given my view, I know it's often confused, uh, my view is that in principle there could be dysfunctions and therefore disorders purely at the psychological level of how meanings interact, how people reason and so on, that don't correspond to a brain physiological dysfunction. Now, of course, we have Nobel Prize winners like Kandel at Columbia saying, you know, parroting the argument, all mental events are brain events, therefore all mental disorders are brain disorders. That's a fallacious argument. And the, the standard, the standard um, um, way of, of refuting it is, at least to get you started thinking about it, is the software-hardware analogy, which is all software 
takes place, runs in hardware, but it doesn't mean that every software malfunction is a hardware malfunction. In fact, most aren't, as we know, and you'd waste your money getting somebody to look into your hardware when you have a software malfunction. So if there is emotional, you know, uh, belief, desire, programming of some kind, it's conceivable that its parameters could go wrong in such a way that there could be a dysfunction at that level without a dysfunction in any brain physiological process. That's what I would hold. Now, I will say anecdotally that I tried to say this to the psychiatric residents at a nearby medical center in New York, and I was met with utter disbelief. Utter, uh, I would say more than disbelief. It was incomprehension. <laughs> I, I, that's just simply impossible. Every mental disorder must be a brain disorder. So we are living in, that's why I said, meant when I said we're living in an era, the brain disease era, where it is assumed. Now, how this will all play out, whether every mental disorder is a brain, uh, that's an empirical question, not a philosopher's, you know, you, as a philosopher you can't just solve that. But I hope that clarifies the point uh, uh, that you were asking about. Next question. Uh, thank you both again for two thought-provoking talks. Uh, oh, sorry, over here. Uh, my name is Brian Pilkington, and I teach philosophy at Aquinas College. And I want to push back a little bit on Dr. Wakefield's Rawlsian move. Uh, and I hope Dr. Sanders will pull me back up the rabbit hole if I go too far. <laughs> so go for it. I I I appreciate the equal opportunity move, and I I think I know where you're going with Rawls, but why is it that this medical response is appropriate as opposed to social activism or making arguments in favor of acceptance? So why is it if someone falls within a normal range, and I can see by the nod, you know where I'm going, but is, is disadvantaged by society, why must that person bear the burdens of acceptance as opposed to the rest of us? It's an excellent question, and it will vary in various, I mean, I think many of us would say that when it comes to children, um, I mean, this argument has actually kind of been made, well, by, by people in the field of ADHD, well, you know, look, in our society, the kids need to learn, this is our educational system, better to give drugs so that they learn and they have opportunity later on. People say this, who study ADHD, psychologists and psychiatrists. Uh, many of us would argue uh, that a better solution is social change, for God's sake, but uh, and change in the school environment. But so, so I'm not I'm not precluding that that argument at all. Um, I do believe, um, you know, a theory of the professions would hold maybe that uh, a kind of Aristotelian theory of the professions would hold that if each profession has an essential goal, I call it the organizing value of a profession. So for medicine, it's health. So why should they do stuff having to do with justice? Um, and that is, every profession also has what I call derived tasks. Due to their skills, their skills are the defined that, that group as the best one to handle something that society wants done. So cosmetic surgery for aesthetic reasons, uh, we all agree, most of us agree, has nothing to do with the ultimate goals of medicine, of health, but there's nobody else that has those skills. So it's given to medicine. So this is given to medicine, as is contraception and, and other reproductive health issues that have nothing to do with real disorder. So, um, so the answer to your question is, uh, once it's established that this is something people are owed, then the medical professions do it because they have the skills. Is it presumed that we will intervene and train everybody? No. First of all, people should, once it's relabeled, this is the problem, labeling it a disorder precludes this whole discussion that you're trying to open up. Should, should we have other options? What if you don't like speaking in public? Should there be other ways, should we develop ways of helping you that don't involve your going through therapy or taking Paxil or whatever? Um, so uh, I see all these options as open once we are honest. The problem now is that we are dishonest and I'm giving an analysis of why our intuitions are that these people should be treated, even though it's pretty obvious that they are false positives. Dr. First, any thoughts on that? Uh, 
this is way out of my area now. Okay. <laughs> I said, I, and I think, you know, I, and I appreciate the comment, and, and you didn't go down the rabbit hole, but I think social, social justice and, and um, in terms of talking about ethics, I, I think hitting on the point, uh, even in the beginning, you know, having the right to do something, but what, knowing what the right thing to do is, is really important. I think that that's really what we want, want to think about. Um, I could say a lot more, but I don't want to interrupt. So, yeah. Um, next question. Yeah, my name is Steve Williams, and uh, appreciate the the presentation. I think you're actually being too kind to the reimbursement system, but mm. uh, but I don't want to go there because there doesn't seem to be any support for it anymore. But uh, what we're going to go to, I I don't know. A uh, question is a little more specific, and and that is I've become aware lately of a of a phenomenon called adverse childhood events, and heard a fairly cogent presentation on it. I wonder if you've, uh, are you familiar with it, with this uh, sort of new developing thinking? Because it gets at this issue of the sort of change in DNA, the change in, uh, in, in, in the neuroscience of the brain, that if you experience a number of adverse childhood events, you actually, your, your, your actual biology changes. And I don't know if this is uh, a, a confluence of, of, uh, of issues, but I wonder what your thoughts might be if, you, if you're aware of it. Talking about trauma, basically. Right? Talking about early trauma. Early trauma, most. most no, there's there's a whole new body of of, right. uh, of new thinking. Well, I don't know if it's new, but it. Uh, I became aware of it just recently. There's a couple new papers that have been published recently, and communities are beginning to adopt this sort of uh, screening, widespread screening. Uh, it's fairly limited uh, right now to a few communities uh, to try to get at what what happened to to right. children or to adults. Uh, that make that that causes dysfunction right. in their life. Absolutely, uh, there is. A, by the way, there there is a, a, a fairly large group I find when I'm giving DSM workshops or stuff like that that is upset that DSM five did not take adequate account of this new research to define some kind of not so much post traumatic in the sense in DSM, but chronic minor. <laughs> traumas that much of the new literature is looking at, um, absolutely we know, and it's not only there, but in genetics as well we're discovering all sorts of ways we didn't realize in which things can be modified, can be reshaped, uh, as well as the basic discovery some time ago, obviously, uh, that we grow new neurons and create new neuronal pathways. We're not frozen in, in our brains after a certain age as they used to believe. So all of this both has to be addressed, but it isn't yet. Um, and it also raises interesting conceptual questions about disorder. If we're all being shaped to some degree by what happens in our childhood, and some are, due to their traumas, are then set for life in certain ways, how does that change how you think about disorder, for instance, or what the boundaries are with, between disorder and non-disorder? I mean, I think... I think the puzzle and the interest goes back all the way back before most of these new discoveries to studies like the Dodge study in which he confirmed of a large group of people who were abused in their childhood that they had a much higher chance of being abusers, this classic finding, of being abusers. But here's what the interesting finding was. The entire effect was explained by the degree to which the early abuse caused the person to have a change in their belief system, their meaning system, that made them believe that things were dangerous and that people would respond violently to them. To those who were early abused and didn't come to believe that, they didn't have higher rates of child abuse later on. To those who came to see the world as dangerous intrinsically, they had higher rates of child abuse later on. So what I'm saying is, it's gonna take us a long, this RDOC is partly aimed at this, is following people longitudinally, developmentally, both normal and traumatized and disordered, trying to get an overall view of how we are shaped in the long run, which we really don't have a clue on. And after all, to define disorder, you have to understand normality. And we're not there yet. And my only, I have one quick comment to that. Just, uh, uh, it's one of the problems with that is just the specificity of having these adverse child events to what happens in adulthood. One of the one of the disorders that was proposed for DSM-5 didn't make it in, and I was in favor of it not going in was a version of fetal alcohol syndrome, psych psychiatric. So, 
The problem was is that they, the original definition was like almost any maternal use of alcohol was enough and some kind of behavioral phenomenon in the child was going to be called this thing. And, you know, if, to try to blame the alcohol for the, this result, because what kind you know, mothers who use alcohol and they're pregnant probably have a lot of other risk factors going on and to blame. So the thing is so complicated that it's one of those things that putting things in the diagnostic system are very, uh, without knowing what's really going on, could create a new false positive problem. So that's why I have to be very careful. Yeah, I think it's important that uh, the, the point you bring up is that the, the number of traumas, the amount can affect people. One of the things we have to be careful of is that, um, you know, two thirds of who we are is how our environment affect, affects us. One third is biologic and different people are, are resilient in different ways. We know people have different types of genetic makeup in terms of how resilient they are to, to trauma. So that's why it's a good screening opportunity um, to review things. If I one, one more comment, yeah. just to take up Michael's point, very good point. That the pro one problem is our theories become so powerful and compelling that we go into the false positives area. I once was doing a study on conduct disorder and into some of the vignettes I was having clinical judgments about whether a kid had a disorder when he was acting antisocially under certain contextual conditions. I threw into one of the vignettes that the young person had been sexually abused as a child. I could, no matter what I put, no matter how rational, no matter what I put into the vignette other than that, at that point in time, all these clinicians in training said, yes, they must have a disorder. It was their theory that child abuse must cause disorder that made them respond rather than any of the cues, any of the contextual stuff that I put in that really was more pertinent to whether their behavior was driven by a dysfunction or not. So it's, it's, a, it's something to think about that we want to get this right without, instead of again, inflating the uh, false positive domain. My name is Henry. All I wanted to say is that the adverse childhood event is not just looking at psychiatric disorders, but they found associations with physical health, asthma, hypertension, cardiovascular things. So it isn't just looking at mental health issues. Absolutely. Yep, I agree. Other questions? My name is Joanne Hoganson, and I'm here um, representing public health. I'm director of nursing at the Kent County Health Department. And one of the things that we work with um, is access to care. And I couldn't help but think, as I heard you, that we in Kent County have a significant access to care challenge, especially around psychiatric needs of adolescents. And it does make me wonder if um, an overdiagnosis may be contributing to filling psychiatric um, offices and clinics and in-house in um, treatment when, in fact, some of those same disorders might be better treated in a support group or in a church youth group or in some other kind of environment, therefore leaving space for those that truly have a disorder. And I was just wondering if you had a comment about that. My guess is that the system is so, un there's such a shortage of clinicians even though in theory that may be the case, I think that there's so many, you know, if you got rid of some of those cases, there'd still be a big access problem. I mean, the access problem between pavement and available clinicians spread out geographically is so huge, uh, I doubt that shift, shifting would make that much of a difference. But that's been argued like for ADHD. I mean, that, that you know, the usual argument against ADHD is being grossly overdiagnosed is actually it's being misdiagnosed that there are normal people being labeled, but there's still lots of people out there who are not getting treatment, so it's a, it's a misallocation. So I think in general, you're absolutely right. I think that every time a normal person is getting resources that doesn't really need it, given how scarce things are, there's all these people out there who really do need it that aren't getting it. I agree. I mean, it, uh, uh, way back in the old days when community mental health centers were new, uh, they were explicitly put in to help the people being deinstitutionalized, to help support them in the community. But there was a natural trend to, te to treat by the clinicians as much as anybody else, to treat uh, what some people dismiss as the worried, well, they might have true disorders, they might not, uh, marital problems, all sorts of problems. Uh, and we really weren't doing our job. I think that 
getting clearer on the false positives. I totally agree with what Michael said. There's a lot of people who need treatment who aren't getting treatment. But getting clearer on this problem would help to allocate resources better. Whether it would clear out the clinics, I'm dubious. But whether it would allocate resources better, absolutely. And an embarrassment to all us clinicians, peer counseling for more milder problems is remarkably effective, even when compared to professional intervention. So peer counseling has not been adequately given its due and used uh, for obvious reasons. <laughs> One last question. Any more questions? I guess we will enjoy watching the elections then. <laughs> Please join me in, in waking, in thanking Dr. Wakefield and Dr. First. Outstanding. <laughs> Thank you for joining us and then enjoy the Michigan fall that's, uh, that's coming and hopefully we'll see you March 27th. Right, right, right. So.